You're listening to the Teach Better Talk podcast featuring expert educators eager to share progressive tactics to reach more students. Teach Better Talk is created by teachers and fueled by passion. Let's get started. Hey everyone, welcome to episode five of the Teach Better Talk. I'm Ray Hewart, and as always, I'm with the wonderful Jeff Gargis. Hello. We are so excited. We have so much in store, Jeff, don't we? I mean, we have an incredible educator we're going to talk to. There's so many things that we get to focus on in episode five. But first and foremost, my first question always, Jeff, how are you doing? I am fantastic. I'm super pumped up. Really excited. Number We're at episode number five, which is really exciting. Um, and we've got Allison Apsey with us today. And Allison, we love you. You know that. We talk about it. We, you've hosted our Twitter chat. We loved it. We went live. Facebook, we're so excited to have you here that you've taken some time out um, of what we know is a very, very busy schedule. So thank you so much for being here. Allison is a 20-year, 20 20-plus 20 year veteran, a uh, teacher and a principal and a school leader in every way, a phenomenal blogger. Your website's fantastic. And your book is absolutely amazing. Path to Serendipity. So, Allison, thank you so much for being with us. How are you feeling right now? Um, well, after that, I'm feeling pretty <laughs> incredible. I love um, hanging out with you guys. The energy you have is palpable, no matter what um, the format is, whether it's a Twitter chat or Facebook Live or a podcast. So I'm just so happy to join you today. Awesome. Absolutely. Well, I have to ask, you know, Jeff gave you a really great introduction. I know you've accomplished a lot, but when someone asks you what you do, what's your typical response? What do you do? I'm an elementary principal, first and foremost. Um, and, and I love the, the terms lead learner um, or, you know, the, whatever the catchphrase is. But I am super proud. I was just having a conversation with Beth Huff about this, about just being super proud to be a principal and all of the components that go into our jobs as principals. Um, so I am, am in an awesome community. I'm a principal, uh, the principal for Quincy Elementary in Zeeland, Michigan, which is right between Grand Rapids, Michigan and the Lakeshore. Um, mm. And I actually live in Grand Haven, Michigan, which is a, a cute little Lakeshore town right on Lake Michigan. So I'm an elementary principal now, but I have taught grades three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. I've been a junior wow. high principal and a high school principal. And I think this is my most favorite job. But I also think that I say that no matter what job <laughs> I have in, in education, because I really do think it's important to, you know, focus on on the good. And uh, I, I enjoy every every role I've had in education for sure. Awesome. So, so touching on your, you know, 20, 20 plus years, uh, multiple different roles, a, a bunch of different, I mean, several grade levels there. Um, yeah, a ton I, of I, experience. You know, I want to touch on that, your experience and that sort of journey to where you are today. You know, I, I always tell our team and I tell everyone that I, I'm very fortunate. I feel very fortunate that I've actually been able to fail a lot. I've learned <laughs> so much from every time I fail. And, and you know, I, I'm, I'm sure you've been there as well and you know where I'm going with this. And, I, and I'm hoping, can you, can you kind of share with us a time that you failed and a time that you kind of take us there with you and how you felt after that failure and then how you overcame it. And then can you share with us what you learned from that? What'd you take away from that? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm just like you, Jeff, in that I've had a lot of opportunity to learn from failure. I mean, it goes from my first year of teaching. I, I sucked. I'm sorry. Maybe I shouldn't say that, <laughs> but I did really bad my first year of teaching so much so that they were not maybe going to ask me back. And through that experience, um, I learned how to create a need-satisfying classroom where any student was able to succeed. But that's not even my biggest failure. I think my biggest failure was um, in my, my first principalship. I was a principal of a, a junior high and a high school. It's actually a K-12 building, and we were organized leadership-wise in an interesting fashion. But we, we were all of the, the, the – it was just one campus – so we had many leaders in the same campus and every day these leaders would get together for lunch and we'd throw out any kind of issues that are going on or really, you know, any successes and we'd put it all on the table and then together we'd sort through it and, um, you know, make a plan for how to improve things or what the next steps would be. 
But there was a huge problem in that, that that table was surrounded by leaders, but there weren't any teachers at the table. So all of these decisions were being made. And then it was like my job to go out and get buy-in from all of the teachers. The teachers need to be at the table with us when we're making the decisions. They need to be a part of the decision-making pro- process. In fact, like buy-in is one of my pet peeves now because I think that's not our role as leaders to get buy-in. Our role is to have a shared mission, shared vision. And even if it's something, you know, for Quincy Elementary that's coming down from my central office and they say, hey, Quincy, you need to implement this. Um, instead of going about getting buy-in, I need to work with teachers on figuring out, okay, how can we make this work best? Here's what we have to do. Mm-hmm. How can we make this happen? So, and, and I didn't realize that I had failed so badly in that aspect in my last principalship until I left. And then um, some things came to light about the feelings of the leadership in the district. And you know, I had to take responsibility for my role in um, those mistakes. So let's flip that around now. Let's flip it to, uh, to a success you've had, whether it's big, small, whatever, whatever that, that sex, success might be. What was a success that you remember that you feel and then what did you take away from that? So, you know, Ray said, uh, she asked me, you know, talk about you. How do you describe yourself? And I said an elementary principal. But I think another way that I describe myself is a person who really values relationships and, and understands the importance of taking good care of ourselves so that we can be our best selves in order to help others. And also understanding that if we want things to be really different in education, we have to be really different. Mm -hmm. And so um, small successes, like if somebody's face lights up when I walk in the room, that's a success. If somebody says to me, you know, if I ask them a question and they say, huh, I never thought of it like that before, that is a huge success. Um, At the end of last year, we, we do, we use eye observation and Marzano's model for teacher evaluations. Mm-hmm. And so I send out the final evaluations to teachers, which are a culmination of all of the observations that we've done throughout the year and feedback meetings that we've done. So it's just really wrapping it up. Mm-hmm. And, and I printed all of those off at the end of the year and I was sending them over to our central office and I picked one up and I just happened to look a little closer at it. And I could see that one of my teachers had commented back to me on the, the evaluation and they said, you make me want to be better. And then Uh, I flipped to the next one and I saw the same thing. And, you know, it wasn't a, that comment wasn't on every single evaluation, mm -hmm. but it was on a couple handfuls of the evaluation. And to me, that is a huge success. If people want to be better because of my role in their lives, like, I, I don't know if I could ask for more. That's, that's fantastic. All right, Allison, I really liked your focus on just like getting teacher feedback and how you're really, how that, that feedback then really not only inspired others to be better, but then kept you moving, right? Like that's the whole thing in education that I really enjoy is, is teachers building up each other and how then that positive feedback can really then affect like the culture of a staff or the culture of a building. What's the most exciting part about education right now for you? So Quincy Elementary has really been working over the past year, actually a couple years, and developing a multi-tiered system of support for behavior and just surrounding the social emotional learning of our students. And then really understanding that the supports that students who've been through trauma need are actually supports that benefit all of our students. So that's been really exciting because it's really looking at our students with a completely different lens. And it's so interesting because we're conducting interviews today. And when we ask our interviewees some questions surrounding you know, classroom management and how they support students, social emotional learning, it just helps us understand how far we've all come together and understanding what our students need in order for school to be a need satisfying place for them in order to be successful and to feel safe here. 
Yeah, especially hearing that you're interviewing new teachers, that was kind of then leads really well into my next question is, what advice do you give a new teacher, right? They've gone through the interview, they, they, they got this first position, maybe it's their first year or maybe up until their third year. What advice does a new teacher need these days to really be successful? I think that number one advice I would give to a teacher is to get connected. And of course, you know, for those of us who are active on social media, uh, there is a component of that that would be social media like Twitter or Facebook or, you know, listening to podcasts, just somehow getting connected so that you can build a network of support and a network of people who inspire you to get better all the time. But it doesn't need to be social media. You know, there's there are, I have colleagues who are an amazing principals who aren't even on Twitter, but they're really connected with other principals across the state in other ways or even other principals across the district. So I, as a first year teacher, getting connected to teachers in your in your building, in your district and then to the larger education community, I think it helps build confidence. It helps us be vulnerable. And that's my other piece of advice is be transparent, be vulnerable. It's okay to not know everything. And it's okay to admit that you've failed and to, you know, go to somebody for support and to learn through that failure. And then just focusing on relationships first in the classroom. If you have a solid foundation of relationships, the sky's the limit. But if you don't have that solid foundation of relationships in the classroom and you have amazing lessons, the students still aren't going to learn. So it's relationships, 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 right? Mm -hmm. Well, and I love that because you touched on relationships in your professional life, but then also relationships in the classroom. And there's so much learning that can be had in both, but having both is essential if you're trying to build a really full mm -hmm. career. Right. Absolutely. Relationships are so important. I love that you, you touched on vul being vulnerable and being transparent. And we, you know, we talk about it all the time, you know, our, our mastery chats, our uh, Twitter chats on Thursday nights where some, it's so awesome. We have those topics that kind of dip a little more into the emotional side of things. How open all these, all these other educators are with each other, just how open, and how transparent they are. And, by doing that, how much they gain from those chats just by saying, I, you know, I struggle with this or this is how I feel and just putting it out there. Like that's such a big piece. And, and I love that, you know, focus on the connection of, of finding those other teachers, whether in your building or, you know, via social media or however, and, and finding those that, uh, that support system for yourself, I think is really, really important. So awesome. I, I totally agree. Love it. All right. So we're going to do these next six questions. I'm going to challenge you. We're going to do them in 15 seconds or less each. Can you do that? Uh, um, maybe you, you up for it? <laughs> Jeff, this is the worst part because I mean, when you put a time limit on something, it's almost like, oh, create so much anxiety. Yeah, but but constraints <laughs> help us be creative. There we right. go. Good yeah, luck. Put that little thing on it. So here we go. We're gonna do six. We're gonna do fifteen seconds or less each. What is one ed tech tool that you cannot live without? Okay, I feel so old school saying this, but iMovie. I love oh, making movies. Nice. I'm all right with that. That's a good answer. What I book are you? What uh, what's a book that you're reading right now? Tattoos on the Heart by Father Gregory Boyle. I just got the book and have just started it, and I am in love already. Awesome. Who do we need to follow right now on Twitter? Jeff Gargas oh. and Ray Hugard. <laughs> love it. Dave Burgess, Tara Martin, Adam Welcome, Amber Tiemann, George Kuros. I think. Like there's such a great movement going with DBC right now. Mm -hmm. And I'm not just saying that because they published the path <laughs> to serendipity for me, but it, there's just this incredible energy that I'm just so proud to be a part of. We it's, it's okay. We love the, the, the Burgess crew here too. So couldn't we do uh, what's, what is uh, the best YouTube channel for educators? Well, um, I don't know. Mine? No, I'm just kidding. It's well, not mine. Right. That can be an answer. <laughs> I don't. I don't watch many YouTube channels, so I can't. All right, let's them. flip it. Well, what's your YouTube channel? What's it called? Allison Apsy. Everything uh, that enough. I am on social media is called Allison awesome. Apsy. All right. So how a about? Oh, wait, we ahead. have to spell it though. A L L Y S O N A P S E Y. And I will link all of this. I, I'll link everything okay, in the okay. show notes. So they'll be able to link that over at teachbetter.com. We'll get all these links. So we'll, we'll make sure that's good. Um, give us one daily, weekly, or monthly routine that you think every teacher should get into. 
So look at your lesson plan book for the day and identify what you are super excited about and what you view as really, really fun. And if you look at your day and there's nothing in there that seems really, really fun to you, stick something fun in. And what is the, love that. What is the best piece of advice you've ever received? The world does not revolve around Alice and Apsy. Oh. It's shocking. Shocking. I know. But it's, it's tough. Yes. <laughs> That's, it's that not is... about me. It's about the person right in front of me. Mm. Yes. That's awesome advice. Love it. You know, at the end, we always ask, like, what and how can people connect with you? And you kind of touched on it before, but if somebody wanted to reach out at listening to this podcast, they're so inspired by everything you're saying. Not only maybe how do they reach out? What's your all your, you know, social media, all that great stuff, but also what's a great focus that you have? And if they have questions on something, you feel like you're somebody who could continue to share that knowledge. Sure. Um, so the path to serendipity, the focus is really um, embracing all of the experiences we go through, whether they're um, great char sorrows or joys beyond our wildest imaginations and looking for the beautiful lessons that are embedded in all of those experiences. And then it really extends itself into the school and our relationships with colleagues and then into the classroom and how can we support students by creating a need satisfying environment for them where they can meet their needs for freedom, power, fun, love and belonging and survival within the functions of what we're asking them to do because they're going to meet those needs. But sometimes they're meeting them and disrupting the learning at the same time. So how can we create an environment where it's needs satisfying and they can meet their needs within the functions of what we ask them to do? And then also um, just supporting students who have been through experienced trauma and then extending that into what supports do we provide for students who have experienced trauma that are good for all of our students? Because every single one of us has been through challenges and and treating each other with care is so important. Yeah, I was so excited when I actually got your book. I mean, I started looking through it. I love the title and the whole mission for the book. Just if you have not read our listeners, if you have not read this book, it is so it's one of those books that once you start reading, you just can't put it down I'm about two thirds of the way through. And I have to ask you, especially since I have you and you can't go anywhere, right? It's just like the best way <laughs> ever to talk to an author. But um, do you have like a favorite chapter or a favorite section of the book that that was just the most fun to share? Okay, so there's two chapters I cried while I was writing them and I couldn't even believe. The first one is, um, it's actually the third chapter and I call them stops in the book. So it's the third stop along the path to serendipity. Yep. And it's about uh, the being bullied in high school and putting myself back in that spot was so emotional. And I graduated from high school almost what, 25 years ago, when I couldn't believe that it was still such an emotional experience. And then the eighth stop, I think it's the eighth stop, that I wrote about um, my mom getting sick and then losing my mom was one, another one where I cried bunches. But one of the most fun chapters to write was the ninth stop, which is called Perception is Reality. And really t thinking about the idea of empathy versus sympathy and I came up with three don'ts of empathy. And the first don't is don't put yourself in their shoes. Like so often we say, well, put yourself in their shoes. How would you feel? Well, you, you can't empathize with somebody by putting yourself in their position because you don't have all of their prior experiences. You don't know what the challenges they've been through and, and what they value. But instead, just trying to feel with the person, understanding what they're feeling is important because I, I just find that so often we place this judgment. Well, I wouldn't react that way. Well, what difference does it make how you would react? You're not that person. You don't have their experiences. You're not in their same situation. Um, so I just, I, I love that idea of, wait a minute, don't put yourself in their shoes. Let them keep their shoes on and try to understand how they feel in their own shoes. Yeah, the way that section is written is so awesome. I, I couldn't agree more. That was a really, really good spot. The one thing I did want to make sure that I also had you share was just all the ways to get in contact with you because my hope 
is that after this podcast, they not only connect with you to keep learning and grow our PLN, but also they go get your book and tell you how fabulous it is. So <laughs> that would be great. I would love that. Yeah. So I'm, I'm like literally at Allison Apsey everywhere. So on Twitter, it's at Allison Apsey or, um, my website is Allison Apsey.com, Facebook, Allison Apsey, YouTube <laughs> channel is Allison Apsey. Um, and my book is the path to serendipity. And I have a, a couple other things in the works. So I'm Ooh, pretty excited. Mm, excited. It's going to be a pretty exciting year for serendipity. Oh, hey, I'm it liking it. First. Something. Yeah. Are, are you, are you <laughs> able to give us any sort of hints or divulge anything at all? Okay. I'll tell you about one of the projects I have going on and it's a picture book and mm. it's a retelling of the three princes of serendip, which is the origin of the word serendipity. It's a Persian, Persian tale from the 15th century. And my retelling is nothing, hardly anything like the original story. But um, so I'm getting illustrations back right now for that project. And it should be out in November. I'm super excited about it. Oh, how exciting is that? That's really cool. That's awesome. Everyone is waiting for November now. Yeah. It's fantastic. Yes. <laughs> So, uh, like always, guys, you know you can go over to teachbetter.com and get all the links and resources, everything we've talked about, everything that Allison's mentioned, especially those really, really important links on how to connect with her and get to a website, follow her on social media, and, and go get the book um, and stay up to date with her as new projects come along the way. So be sure to head over to teachbetter.com for that. Also, please be sure to hit subscribe so you don't miss any of the other episodes of Teach Better Talk. And if you can give us a rating and a review, we would absolutely appreciate that. Allison, is, you have been so fantastic, and we really, really appreciate your time and chatting with us. Um, so thank you so much for that. And guys, until next time, let's get out there and let's teach better. Mm -hmm.